Hello everyone, my name is Mohamed Raza and I'm also a research engineer <coughs> in Shitsia and working on my PhD as well. Well, uh, in the morning session you have seen the technology of uh, HVDC transmission system, what are the circuit breakers, what are the limitations, and all this factor. But in this session we will see how we can apply that and why we need this technology, like why we have to build this HVDC transmission system. To understand that, we have to see first what is our network in Europe. Later on, I will tell you uh, what kind of network we can make on the offshore network, either it is AC or DC network. So when we talk about the transmission network in Europe, we say it is an integrated network. What does it mean by integration? Integration means if there's a disturbance in one part of the network, it will affect directly or indirectly at the rest of the part. So all the European countries are interlinked with each other. So in order to coordinate this operation and uh, to avoid uh, some unwanted disturbance, the transmission system operators uh, from 34 countries are joined together on a platform called ENTSO. It's a European network transmission system. Their objective is to establish a cooperation between uh, TSO uh, at both national and international level, and to develop the network and to see the uh, marketing and perform some research if it is needed. They also provide us some statistics uh, about the energy generation, consumptions, and the state of the, uh, uh, like the statistics of the power in the European continent. And we can see from this plot that the consumption in electricity throughout last four years has been reduced. So in 2014, within European area, we have 2.4% less consumption as compared to 2013. If we see per country basis, like how much each country have reduces the consumption per year, so we can see the blue Session is tho those are the country have who reduces the consumption, and the, the green one is the one who have increased their consumption compared to the last year. But overall, the energy has been reduced. But this happened because of the mild weather. Uh, this could be happened because of we have uh, energy efficiency system, or because of economical slowdown as well. Because maybe many industries has moved out from the Europe to the uh, Asia or other parts <coughs> of the world. Seeing this, of course, to balance the power, you have to reduce the generation as well. <coughs> so here you can see the total net generation uh, in last four years it also has been reduced. But it also depends on which technology it has been reduced. So wind and solar energy, they are increased by 12% each uh, in comparison to the fossil uh, fuel like uh, lignite or coal or gases. They have been reduced 7% and hydro and nuclear generation is stable throughout the, throughout the years. So each bar, each bar represent over here each year from 2010 to 2014. And we can see the green uh, is the renewable sources, which is wind energy mostly and solar energy, is gradually increases. But still, in 2014, within the European area, we have uh, more percentage of fossil uh, energy. Uh, let's talk about the wind generation within the European countries. Uh, here you can see the percentage, which is the percentage of uh, the sh share, in national, uh, share energy of wind energy in 2014 by this country. So let's take example of Spain. It has 19.1% wind energy uh, generation in this 2000, uh, 2014. Uh, here you can see the, the share of wind energy in percentage point. Percentage point means how much percentage they have increased or decreased compared to the last year. So in this case, the Spain has reduced its wind energy generation 0.8% uh, comparative to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to this, like last year. Of course, uh, in 2014, it is 19.1%, so last year it was like 19.9% share. So uh, rest of the country, like Greens, they, they have increased their wind generation in the, in the European, uh, in the European network. So overall, the wind generation has uh, generation uh, has been increased. Yes. And what would be the reason for uh, reducing the wind generation? Reduce, reducing generation. What is the reason for reducing the wind generation? Reducing the generation. Uh, I told you this is because the weather condition as well. No. 
the o and uh, economical and i think uh, the the main reason i think what what was the last one? uh efficiency that's it in germany i think most of the european countries they are improving their appliances like the heating in the houses they are imp improving their system to be isolated so they use less uh, generation as well so this is these three are the main factor uh, told by this uh, transmission mm -hmm. system operator but i think the main factor could be the industry because they they take more uh, power generation and because of the economical they probably moving out maybe africa or asia they they, they have a cheaper labor as compared to Okay, so this is the load flow diagram in the in the European area at taken at 15th of April at 11 a.m. Central European time. This will tell uh, us how the power flow within the European network. If we zoom in here a little bit, can I? Oopsie. No, you can't see. Anyway, my, my idea is to show you the some factor over here, the how much uh, each country is exporting uh, energy to another country. So let's take example of Germany to Netherlands is around about 3,425 megawatt, and similarly Netherlands is also exporting something like uh, 1,200 uh, megawatt to Belgium. Uh, the reason is like. Because some of the transmission line does not exist between one country to another country. Like for the Belgium, there is no interconnector between Germany to, to Belgium. Uh, it is not necessary the, if the one country is having a lot of uh, generation, it will use in this country. So they have to uh, transmit to another country. So it's, a, it's like the path. It's an international interconnector that transmits power from one area to another area. So in this case, we have more uh, stress on the interconnectors if the transmission line does not exist uh, between that uh, generation and consuming country. So uh, if in future we have a lot of wind generation, and then this, uh, let's, I think we are seeing from the statistics that most of the wind farm are installed at, uh, at the North Sea over here. And there are, I think, two main countries, rather than the neighbor countries, who, who will import all of this uh, uh, generation from the wind farm, and then they export all over the world. <coughs> So the interconnector over here will be overloaded. So we can say over here that there are two main factors through which we need an offshore grid. The one <coughs> to, to, to reduce the stress on the interconnector, international lines, and to, to compensate, like to, to observe the renewable resource of energy. The, the question is, okay, it's well known, it's, you can find in the literature that everybody talk about, we need wind energy generation because we have to uh, reduce our dependency on the fossil fuel which is expensive in from political point of view as well and the resources are limited so according to this uh, statistic in 2014 there are uh, there are 10 countries who export more than 10 percent <coughs> of their generation and there are 13 countries who import 10 percent of uh, more than 10 percent of their consumption uh, the electricity from another country so it's just a uh, uh, transmission system network diagram of El Belgium. The red line is the 380 kV AC cable, and the green line is the distribution network like 220 kV uh, line. We can see we have two interconnectors between Netherlands and the Belgium over here, and there are two connections between France and, uh, in France basically there are two connections over here, this and this one. We can see the Belgium network transmission is connected with the Luxembourg uh, transmission system through which they are connecting to the, to the Germany. But the problem is uh, this transmission system is like a distribution network. Uh, it's not a transmission system and half of the uh, network is owned by the Belgium uh, or transmitter operator which is ALIA and the half is owned by the German, I think it's RWE, I suppose. Uh, there is a plan in future that to install this HVDC line. The, the purple line is the HVDC line representation in the diagram, and the dash means it's under construction, it's not in operation. So we can also see for the Belgium uh, network, uh, we have the HVDC line over here to go, going toward the Great Britain. If we see the scenario in offshore network, we are seeing that on the North Sea, we are installing a lot of wind farm. 
with the direct connection of uh, HVDC line, but it's an under, under construction. And we have some uh, HVDC connection between Sweden and Germany already used over here. So if we foresee in the future that if we have to transfer a lot of uh, energy from this wind farm to another country, then we have to follow this path, which ultimately you are it's not a optimized path and you have you have lost a lot of energy in this direction so the concept is why not we just transfer the energy from here to here similarly if you see this wind farm uh, the Krieger flex is a newly uh, wind farm which is going to be developed soon <coughs> previously they were planning to make this as a offshore HVDC grid but just because of the economical uh, perspective they have gone back to the AC transmission line, this is 220 kV, and this is Baltic Sea, I think 150 kV transmission line. And previously their idea was to formulate an offshore network, AC network over here, and then connect this to, to countries which, uh, with, uh, with HVDC line. This may help them to for, uh, for the trade perspective as well, but economically uh, the AC connection was still cheaper solution. So this has summarized that why we need offshore grid. The first point is to have better control over power flow. Uh, what does it mean? Like right now we have an AC system, and in AC system the power flow flows according to the impedance of the network. And in order to control this power flow according to your requirement, you need a phase shifter transformer. Uh, this is the basic uh, technology. The problem with the phase shifter transformer is if you have a two country connecting together, you have uh, you have to synchronize it with the both country, and basically you have to synchronize the phase angle of the country, and both countries are imposing this reference uh, reference voltage, and you have to create the difference of this angle and to to control the power flow, which is a bit uh, complicated, and you don't have much flexibility in this control scheme. So if we have a HVDC system, we isolate the system and then we can control our power flow easily uh, comparatively to uh, offshore uh, like AC system. The second is, I already mentioned, reduce bottleneck on international <coughs> interconnectors. So if you have direct connection from a uh, wind farm to the to the like uh, another country, <coughs> you, you can just bypass all existing uh, transmission system. Improve the connection between big load center around the North Sea, it's the same point. Transmit indigen indigenous offshore renewable electricity to where it can be used the same trade con uh, concept. Development of more interconnection between countries, which is also you can also connect uh, two countries with the HVDC lines more uh, because you have to bypass uh, the sea to, without going to the, uh, you know that uh, the capacitance effect in the cable is more in sea compared to the online if you use uh, AC line, but in HVDC you don't have this capacitive effect. And of course, uh, you need to integrate the renewable energy. But um, just to have an idea, uh, is the like the the the, the price of a back-to-back -back configuration uh, HVDC line uh, much higher than uh, than build uh, like a phase shifter transformer? So is is kind of comparable? Is like the the HVDC is like super. The thing is, in HVDC we are using voltage source converter. Uh, there are two con concept line community converter and voltage source converter. I, I will show you in a couple of slides the difference. The in voltage source converter, the te technology that we have, we don't have in a high power. Mm -hmm. So when you want to build a transmission line as an interconnector, of course you need to have a highest capability to transfer because it's a trade. You you don't going to make it many uh, after uh, after every years or two years. So in this case, the technology is limited by the converter size. And they are not uh, cheap right now, comparative to AC transmission system. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the main factor. And the second, if you see some European part, that we we have to go through sea. So the land connection is limited. You are you are limited to the resources because of policy, government regulation. To acquire the land, uh, permission from the go uh, government <coughs> is is not that easy now anymore. And further, you are also installing the wind farm. Okay, in the future there are a couple of wind farm in uh, Great Britain. It's like Great Grabber, uh, I think it's uh, it's called like that. London Array. They are more than 1.2 gigawatts, and so of course the it's not a requirement of uh, UK to have this energy. So they need to export it, and 
the connection has to be through AC, uh, so through the C. The AC transmission line is not suitable in yeah. this case. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I just, uh, I just want to, to picture the, if the, like, if there is like a, a power transaction between two different countries in, let's say, a, a, a normal situation with land uh, and you can go with a, with a, with a AC line easily. AC line is still preferable because it's a mature technology. It's a mature technology. You already have the system for many, many years. It's cheaper as well. There are many operators, uh, many manufacturers who are making, building these transformers and all this stuff. Okay. So main thing is economic uh, perspective. Right? Okay. So what kind of offshore <coughs> wave we can have in the future? First, of course, uh, we have to move to our HVDC. As I already explained, we have no reactive power uh, in the DC cable. So in first stage, we can also have the wind farm hub. Like we can connect different offshore wind farm together and then transfer the power accumulatively to the onshore grid uh, through one DC transmission line system. And the second is, if we already have the interconnector <coughs> in HVGC, we have a wind farm and we just connect with this existing transmission system that we have seen in. Uh, from the clear flex uh, wind farm location, it, it could be a possible solution. And the second is, we have the hub connection, and then we connect the two hubs of wind farm together with, uh, with the FDC system, and this is how we can enhance the trade uh, uh, of the energy from one, con uh, one country to another country. And we can use the existing uh, like we can say infrastructure as well. So, uh, let's see in detail what is wind power plant hub. In this situation, situation I say that uh, if we have a couple of wind farms, we can connect together and formulate a hub solution and use that DC line over here. And basically, this study has been performed by Offshore Grid. Uh, it's a European uh, uh, like a project where they propose this and they, they did the economical analysis and they say that. If we have the wind farm location from the onshore more than 50 kilometer, then it is suitable economically instead of connecting directly with the with the AC line or individual wind farm. So less than 50 kilometer, we still use AC transmission system. So if the wind farm is connected, uh, rather the distance between wind farm substation to each other is within the distance of 20 kilometer. Uh, this is better to connect as a one uh, offshore hub. If it is far, then it's better to have separate <coughs> Now the question over here, that what will, the, what will be the capacity of this transmission line in this case? So we still have, we, we're still limited by the standard av uh, available VSC HVDC system. So we cannot increase uh, uh, the size of the capacity. So we can say that to plan for the long term, uh, we have the biggest constraint how to des design the capacity of this hub. Second scenario, we can also have like, we have the wind farm, if they are close to the already existing uh, interconnector, so we just connect it in the, with this line instead of connecting to the, to the onshore. And if the two countries are quite close, then we can use directly a new internet interconnection line, we can use that as well. So the distance where we can connect this tie-in is a nonlinear function and depend on the power and the and the solution with the different uh, in distance. So either it is connected to this point or here, it, it it depend on the power and the location of the wind farm as well. <coughs> well, in this also uh, in this case we can also see a couple of two points in which that we can inst install this uh, wind farm capacity twice the size of this interconnector because. Uh, we can send half the power here and half is power here, so both transmission lines can work on their rated power, but the size of the wind farm or the hub is twice of the interconnectors over here. So in third topology, we can say that uh, we are connecting two hubs <coughs> to DC line, so the main advantage is we can also have the trade between two countries if the distance between two countries is quite, quite <coughs> So, as I mentioned, um, for this offshore gear, we, we, we need to use a water source converter as compared to line commuted converter. What is the main difference between that is 
the voltage source converter has the ability to create a grid, <coughs> like a black star, because on the offshore we, we cannot establish the grid. We, we don't need to use the AC transmission line. Uh, we want to avoid that, and we cannot uh, build the network with the line committed converter, which always synchronized with the grid frequency. The disadvantage is uh, this uh, line community converter is mature technology and uh, they have high power capability as compared to voltage source converter. Second advantage for the voltage source converter is the ease in the power flow direction change. So we can change the power flow direction very easily in voltage source converter because the voltage polarity is fixed and you are just changing the direction of current flow. Whereas in line community converter, you have to reverse the polarity of a DC source, like the, the voltage level, to, which is not a straightforward uh, procedure. To the so uh, simple point-to-point -point configuration, uh, you have seen this in the morning as well. So the main advantage of the single point-to-point -point configuration is we don't need a DC circuit breaker. As Ata mentioned in the morning that we don't have this technology and we are limited by this, this factor. Uh, so we can do the simple protection by the AC <coughs> circuit breakers and we can use the DC choppers at the onshore side if there's a fault here and we can burn all the power receiving in this end and we can cut off this converter here. In this, like we have two different uh, operational mode. The grid side converter work in the grid synchronous mode in, in which the main frequency is provided by the grid, not by the converter, and <coughs> it's played in the power control mode. And offshore side, the converter has to provide the main frequency to the network, and all of the wind turbine has to synchronize with this, with this frequency. Moving on, moving on, <coughs> we can say that now we can build an offshore AC network. So what, we what does it mean by offshore AC network? We have an AC network with the AC connection and we're connecting the offshore uh, wind farm together. The distance is less than 20 kilometer. And we have more than one converter uh, controlling, well, uh, we can say that at this moment, transferring power from this, uh, this offshore hub. <coughs> now, what are the operational mode in this case? We can say that uh, one is called master slave, which required communication between converters, which means the one converter is master and the rest is considered slave. The one, the one which is master provide the frequency and control the frequency of the grid, and the rest of the converter synchronized with this frequency. But if one converter goes, like the master converter goes out of failure, then you need a communication to switch other converter to into the master mode and then provide the frequency. So communication, there are communication delay, and then uh, the stability of the network is uh, complicated to maintain, and in some period of time, you, you interrupt the operation as well. In the second method, it's called root control method. In, in this method, all the converters are providing the frequency, and they work as a synchronous machine to the network. So if one converter goes out, other will automatically control in the frequency, and the system can remain in operation. So in this method, we can have multiple slack sources in the offshore network, controlling frequency more than one converter. Uh, with, the, with this scheme, we can also uh, like <coughs> support the voltage by controlling the reactive power. You can manage the reactive <coughs> power by changing the set point of the converter. And do they have to be all of them be VSC, or they can yes. also tell uh, some of them? I mean, in this the other are imposing the frequency. Yeah. Yes, you can also install the L LCC if you have one VSC which establish the converter and they, they are discussing about this concept as well. Uh, I think in the morning someone proposed, mm. or Joan, no. Uh, you mean the DC One in VSC and one, in, one is LCC. LCC, no, 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 he didn't explain okay. that. Yeah. But there are some literature available uh, and then they are discussing about this possible as well. But basically, it's, it's, you have to have a redundancy as, as well. If one master just goes out, then what the uh, rest of the LCC converter is going to do? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you have, uh, in the, uh, just before Monica says, we have some multi-terminal configuration as well, just to, uh, to, to transfer the power to, to, to different location. 
So if you have a multi-terminal DC uh, system, then you need a circuit breaker. <coughs> How can we avoid this situation? Because the circuit breaker is the main the limiting factor in this case. One possibility is the multi-VSC control system, like a multi infeed system. If you see this structure, the both converters are connected to the same option network, but they have point-to-point -point configuration. So we don't need a DC circuit breaker over here. And the gate frequency is provided by both converter. If one transmission system goes out, you can still uh, operate the network. So the principle is designing of the internal control system based on the point-to-point. -point. You can, it's, it's, I think there are many HVDC connection point-to-point -point is already exist. So the control mechanism could be looked like this. So you have internally current control and then you, you have voltage control, which is like point-to-point -point configuration. So when you want to connect to the multi infeed uh, configuration, you have a distributed control system depending on this uh, group concept. And then you can control the power sharing between two converters as well as setting this gain values. <coughs> So uh, apart from offshore AC hub, we can also formulate uh, the DC hub, which means we are connecting at the DC side uh, all the converters. It's, a, it's called multi-terminal DC network. So we can connect uh, in different from radial network, or ring, ring, radial network, ring network, or mesh, or star. But it, then the question is, yeah, you need a circuit breakers. How much circuit breakers you needed, and what will be the protection scheme? So this is the main uh, factor here in designing. In multi-terminal, you have the question is who will control the DC voltage. I think uh, Edu will present you in multi-terminal and then in detail how to control uh, the DC voltage in this case. Uh, just to have an overview, like one could be a master-slave concept. So one control the DC voltage and the rest is like a slave who would who, who import the power at the set point. Or you can have a DC root control. They all, uh, not all, like the converters who are in the onshore, they have the group characteristic and they both work as a slack source like uh, in, the, in the DC network. But the problem here is you will have a fluctuating power flow which because the wind power is changed and your power is changing according to this. So uh, one concept is to have some limit. So at a particular power in feed, you have a constant DC voltage and then after that you can, uh, the slave can control the DC voltage as well too. <coughs> so I wrote this over here, one example in China. The I think the first one multi-terminal DC system in which they use plus minus 160 kV DC line and they are connected to wind farm. One is 100 megawatt and then the second is 50 megawatt and it's connected on the onshore with 110 kV uh, and the capacity is 200 megawatt. Just to summarize, well, I called it 5W of wind energy, like why we need a number. We have a resource limitation, of course why wind energy is proven technology, by offshore we have high potential and we have limitation <coughs> on onshore, why HVDC because the longer the distance and the higher the power you have, you need HVDC system because of the losses and the AC transmission system you are limited with that and why multi-terminal the main is security of supply, trade and economical perspective. That's all, thank you for your time. <coughs>